<laughs> we are here tonight with Herb Ferret of Little USA Solar, uh, one of our wonderful partners uh, on multiple grants, grant applications. Um, Herb, among other places, works in a, a place called Union Springs, Alabama, part of Alabama's Black Belt. And uh, I could introduce Herb, but I will not do him justice. So I made him promise not to be too humble in introducing himself and Little USA Solar. Take it away, Herb. Well, thank you for that, Kyle. And something I never told you is that I named my first nephew's middle name is Kyle. So, oh. you know, <laughs> so you are you as soon as they, I learned about you at this point a year or two ago, I had to smile. Uh, <laughs> so uh, Little USA started off as a uh, idea that was pitched by me at our we have a biannual family reunion at my at, uh, with my family. Uh, and as far as myself, my the majority of my day job is I'm an editor. The majority of my work is long form documentaries, uh, mostly has been for national PBS and MSNBC and the major networks. Uh, and uh, well, Rev is going to want to talk to you. I you know, know he is. Hound. Yes. Well, there you go. You know, and and the, well, the pandemic caused lots of things, but one thing it did do in a positive way, which there have been positive influences or outcomes from the pandemic, is that it it allowed my team and myself to uh, be able to focus more on Little U.S. Little USA. Uh, so, and what I do like about this project and what I am going through is that I am learning as I do and I edit. I mean, producers hire me because I don't know something about a subject and I like not knowing about it because as my job by the end of the time that I finish editing the project is that I know as much as my viewer does and it is my responsibility to make them as knowledgeable as they can be. And it's the same thing here with Little USA. Uh, uh, my goal is to be able to uh, uh, move through this process, surround myself with subject matter experts and enable me to become a better CEO and, and founder in the end. So one thing about the project uh, as we move through my slides. Okay, so let me get that going. All right, so this is, I would say, about two thirds of my family. And my one reason why that we've talked about Little USA being a campus uh, is because I come from a family of educators. My mother uh, graduated with a master's degree in the 50s from. Uh, Alabama A and M, and as you know, as for a black woman, that is a major accomplishment. My grandmother in Union Springs, Alabama, started the Head Start program. So mm -hmm. the idea of education in our family is is top of mind. And I was the very first grandchild to graduate from college. So the, a lot of influence and a lot of push on education, especially in my community was extremely important. And that is why we also focusing on how do we enable Union Springs to be able to be a better city and also to form what we want to do, which is create a family legacy project. Okay, let's see if this will start. Yes, this is uh, my great grandfather, Judge Riley Jordan. And on the left is that, that's the store that he built in 1899 that still exists in Union Springs. Uh, and the reason that he built that store is because during the Great Depression and, uh, and earlier on in the early 1900s and 10s, blacks could not shop at white stores. And so, they took it upon themselves to be able to do that. Uh, uh, and this is, continues to push now what we want to do, which is the other part about Little USA, is how do uh, we continue to encourage uh, entrepreneurship, you know, it, within the students and the people that we bring forth through the, the group. And this is Union Springs. Uh, this is the entire town, so don't get too excited. So it's definitely a, it's a town of three uh, thirty eight hundred people, 
and the entire county of Bullock County is only a little over 10,000 people. And the one important thing about small towns and especially ones in the rural south is that they, the, the population is declining. The reason it's declining is because nothing to do, work isn't as plentiful, and the young people have to leave in order to be able to A, make a name for themselves, uh, or because the city itself isn't encouraging them to stay because the benefits aren't around. And that's another reason for being able to uh, for, allow Union Springs to grow as a population center again by allowing this, this, the, whoever we are trained and people as they get trained to bring the resources back into the town. And just in case, you know, like who is famous, Eddie Kendrick's lead singer, Temptations. Yep, Union Springs. I had to throw that in. Got to give him some crud, you know. Now, as we go through this and we look at what Union Springs has, these, these figures are, as you see, a, a few years old. But I did some other research, and it's still pretty much in line with the way it is today. Uh, the majority of females are in sales and uh, food prep. Uh, health techs, the things that are more or less focused towards the, the uh, typical black uh, person of color in the town. And then if you look at the males of the, the idea of going in production, construction, materials, all of that, and, and down towards the things as you see, the legal, uh, not very, extremely small portion of the population is doing that. Uh, and then these are the sad facts about Little USA. When you compare them to, when you look at the national average of how Bullock County uh, is in comparison to the rest of the United States, you know, we, we see the numbers that are on the screen and we see the amount, how the poverty rate, et cetera, proportionately speaking, is extremely high. And the other thing that we are focused on because the, the topic that we're going to be bringing up here and mentioning about is agrivoltaics is the, the relationship between race and food deserts. And this is a map that, uh, that shows you the concentration and how concentrated in predominantly black areas food deserts are. And let's just zoom down a little bit. And then we get into Union Springs and you see the little dot, the entire city of Union Springs is covered by a food desert because to the best of my knowledge, there is, there is only, there's one black grocery store in the entire town, which is honestly took over the reins a little bit from my, from my great grandfather. Uh, and then when you look at the census track and seeing how many of what the actual population and how things are divided in Union Springs. Remembering that Union Springs only has a population of 37, a little over 3,000 people. And yes, why go into a business where are you going to be having so much work? <laughs> Alabama power uh, is not very solar friendly. And should I say the state of Alabama, let's not just be specific about Alabama power. And Pretty as you sure. can see, yes. And as you can see, uh, again, I, I did a little more research and looked at 2021 and they went to a D. <laughs> so when you think about where Alabama is and who is benefiting from from the idea of green tech and solar, et cetera, uh, it, it's, it is not the citizens of unions. It is not the citizens of Alabama. And they were drug yeah. kicking and screaming to a D, there's still an F in energy efficiency. Thank you. You know, uh, yes, they are. And as you look at this, the mix of where they put their time and the money, which is honestly because this is atypical. Uh, this is where it has been for decades. And so the transition to solar is ripe, is as any good business person is, you know, you build it and they will come. And that's really honestly what our idea is. Yeah, think about what's happening with natural price gases these days. Correct, exactly. You know, um, 
So what does what does Little USA want to do? We a want to be extremely aggressive for introducing STEM based curriculum into uh, being been an outlet and extension campus for for that for middle schoolers and high school. Uh, we want to be able to offer career training, et cetera, for uh, uh, those of working age. Uh, and how are we going to do that? Uh, one way we're going to do it is through an EV charging station and yes, barbecue pit. Uh, because one thing that we were talk about is that EV charging, you don't go there, you're, you're, it takes 20 to 30 minutes to do an average charge with extremely efficient chargers. So therefore, the business of being an EV charging station means that we need to create a destination. And so in creating a destination, uh, what, what are people going to do when they come? You know, and so it, so that you get attracted to come there, not just to charge your car, which we can talk more about that a little bit later, but also so that you have an experience because it is a small town. And one thing that I always say to my friends that live here in California, I say living in Union Springs is L.A. without traffic, meaning people drive from town to town to town to town and spend 30 minutes on the road because it only takes them 30 minutes to go to another town. You know, and so therefore the drive is not painful. So you constantly are going to Tuskegee or Birmingham or someplace like that in order to have a good time to have a restaurant. It's not a big deal. So how can we create that kind of destination point at Little USA in order to allow people to have a reason to come there uh, in addition to the fact that it's an EV charging station. Uh, and the second part of the EV charging thing, because like most gas stations, we aren't gonna make that much money on the charging. The money is gonna be made in what you do while you're there. And this is a business first. Yes, it is a, it's a nonprofit, but every nonprofit needs a for-profit entity in order to be able to do it, you know? Uh, and then in thinking about also in, in, in where we are with curriculum and training, uh, we are within seven, uh, there are seven learning institutions within a 50 mile radius of us. Auburn, Tuskegee Institute, I mean, I'm sorry, Tuskegee University, just to name two, you know, so us being able to be positioned geographically as an extension campus is, is perfect. And then moving on to the agrovoltaics, business-wise, if we're harvesting from the sun, why not also harvest from the earth at the same time? Uh, we sort of like killing two birds with one stone, you know? So, so by being able to grow underneath, we are answering the problem of the food scarcity that I mentioned earlier. Uh, from farm to fork can be less than 24 hours. Think about that. The restaurant that we build on campus, you'll be able to pick the greens that you eat an hour before they go on your plate. That's the kind of things that we're trying to encourage and make happen. And, and it's not a question of expense. You think about this as something that only happens in New York or San Francisco, but it doesn't have to. I mean, another lesson about the food, about the pandemic, what did it teach you? It taught us how bad and poor food distribution is and also how few people cover, carry that. So thinking globally, eating, eating locally is, is, the, is the way that one must think, you know, uh, especially when, when we can bring uh, uh, the ability for people to have true, fresh produce immediately and not at an exorbitant price because there aren't any middle persons in the, in between us and your table. And that's the reason for the produce market. Now, keep going. So this is the way that the property looks now. Uh, fully wooded, mostly second growth underbrush. Unfortunately, as you see, the property to the south of us is killer. It's an actual tree farm and they, they uh, are able to do more. Uh, but looking at where we are, you see, uh, uh, this is where it's gonna be. And it's right off of Highway 82 and 29, which is the other reason for doing this, this here is that we're on a reasonably major thoroughfare in, uh, and we will get traffic. And this is what Freedom by Design, Auburn University, the Auburn University's architecture department took on Little USA as a project. 
The Freedom by Design is a national student-led group of architecture students, uh, and their professor allowed them because of the uh, because of the project and what we're doing, and the focus being what it is to make this a complete two a one year course for for the the students, uh, one hundred percent volunteer. Uh, and what we're also going to do with this is that we are we are now reaching out to local to the HBCUs in the area so that we can pull in those freedom by design teams so that we do get as much of a student based uh, hands on to our campus design. Uh, that was one design. This is another idea that they had. Uh, what we're going to do with all these designs is combine them, work on them because that's what you do but this is as you can tell going from fully wooded to something as like this and they even included as you can see circulation paths uh bike paths because the area to the north is all wetlands which we're going to which is a blessing in disguise uh what it does it took away from us the ability to develop that into solar but what it does do is allow us to have more nature Friends of the River, 4-H clubs, those kinds of things can, uh, we can now recruit th that type of behavior into, and that type of organizations into the campus in order to allow this to also be more of the outdoor education learning uh, curriculum that we want to be able to incorporate. And also the reason for the paths, remember you got 30 minutes. So you come here with your bike, you come here with your dog because we're going to build a pond and no dogs can be off leash. Yes, they will be <laughs> so they can go swimming, especially because Union Springs is a bird dog capital, bird dog trial capital of the United States. You know, something else I learned, you know, about my town. And then they went so far as to even design what type of plants can be planted and presenting, as you see with the little arrows, informational kiosks that would go throughout the campus so that you actually have the ability to explore the campus and to be a part of it and to, so that it's not just a bunch of solar panels sitting on the ground. You know, it is an experience. It truly is a campus. Uh, and then looking at the type of buildings and structures, and these aren't final, you know, or, but they're just the ideas about the kinds of architecture and things that we want to place throughout the campus. Uh, everything from tiny homes for the veterans who would be our first hire is the because we need the security and the, that type of thing on the campus. So we plan on building tiny homes and being able to allow that, that them to be our permanent staff. Uh, the shed that you see on the left is an idea uh, because when, as we go through the campus build, every vendor that walks into our campus is going to be required to hire an apprentice, a, have a paid apprentice program. And the fact that it's fully wooded, the campus doesn't start when everything, the campus starts with the woods being cut down. That's when it starts. And the shed, as we call this building on the left, will, will also be used to service the solar panels, to cut and mill the lumber that we will keep on campus, and other things as we go through the demonstration I'll show you. And that's the other reason, the other thing that the pandemic taught us. Classrooms, can't have them. Outdoor ed, period. Being able to have classrooms that are more, that are outside focused, uh, building pavilions that are spaced throughout the campus that allow A, for our NAPSAP training, which is the highest level of solar certification that you can have, uh, which will be our ground, uh, should I say, the, the ground uh, breaking, or should I say, the, the that's the, what we will exhibit the most or push the most as far as being able to train solar techs in, for our, the citizens of Union Springs uh, and Bullock County. And then we do finally get to the rest stop, uh, as I've been talking about, because it's not just a charging station. It is a destination, and that's what we want it to be. And then circling back to the wood, we're gonna be employing things from whole tree structures. Notice the trees when they're cut, they aren't milled and taken away. They're incorporated into the design of the facility. We want 
to reuse as much as we do. Every roof that we building that we build will either be solar or living, period. Whatever footprint we take up will be taken up again by a living roof or solar because we need it to produce energy in order for us to be able to do things. But being able to repurpose a portion of the wood because not all of it is structurally good enough, but no matter how little, the goal is to repurpose as much as the materials on the property as we can. Yes, there are many statewide initiatives that we need to be able to take care of. And that is one thing that we're really searching for is how we can get connected better with politicians in order for things like earmarks, et cetera, to be pushed to us uh, because grants, et cetera, we, obviously everyone's really aggressive about trying, we are about doing that. However, the idea of us getting our initial $150,000 so that we can fully develop our curriculum, fully develop the website, fully develop the NAPSEP training courses, et cetera, is important. And again, recapping our freeways where we're located, uh, and also repurposing as much as the materials as we can on the property in order to make use of it. And that picture on the right, as you can see, is a parking lot with whole trees products supporting those panels. Yes, uh, that is my Uncle Bernard on the right, Soul Brothers Kitchen. It is his hot links recipe that we'll be featuring on the campus. and. In addition to featuring his and uh, his recipe, or should I say his his child, uh, Marcus, my cousin, is going to be bringing this to line, uh, is that how do we now grow another business out of the rest stop? The food trucks that we will have initially in order to A, service the lunch crowd at the rest stops, uh, how do they cook their foods? How do they prepare their meals? Well, the idea is that at this rest stop also is that we will have ghost kitchens or a commercial kitchen that can be rented. And so what does that also do? It allows us to be able to serve food 24 seven because it's a rest stop. So the idea of being able to come there if you're traveling on 82 or 29 and be able to get whatever is being cooked. And that's the fun part of this. It won't be like McDonald's where you get the same menu every day. It's going to have the different chefs and the pop-up kitchens and the pop-up chefs that will be working bakers from three until in the morning until six, you know, uh, uh, other people that will work the earlier shift, you know, so that is the, all of these things are dreams and ideals and what we idealistically would like to try to incorporate into the business. But that is the goal, you know, and also what this allows is that it again grows yet another business. It grows the pop-up shelves, the ones that want to go into restaurant management, et cetera, to be able to have a place to be able to do that. Uh, uh, and the picture top left, circling back now to the EV charging, the amount of electric cars, we being realistic, there's not a bunch of Teslas in Union Springs in Bullock County. Our business plan is to be prepared for medium duty, trucks, UPS, Amazon Prime, those kinds of trucks. And that is another connection that we're, we need to make if we're fleet managers of UPS. FedEx just bought, they are, they are no longer buying anything but electric trucks for, for that very reason. And so why have this at Little USA? Why would they charge there? A, we're going to be powering our batteries, et cetera, from the sun. We will not be using Alabama power to power your trucks. So it'd be cheaper. Second, what does it do? Then you at UPS only have, can buy a smaller battery. The biggest expense in the car is the battery. So that means that they can get a smaller battery, travel their routes, charge for 30 minutes while they're on their lunch break and continue their route. That is the, that's the idea behind being able to have this. And also what does this do for us as a community? Not, interest, not necessarily DoorDash and Grubhub and all of that, but it will allow UPS to be more aggressive or FedEx to be more aggressive and being able to approach and get to Union Springs and get to uh, Union City and get to the towns that are close by and extending their routes in a way. And hopefully that means that they can lower their prices because they don't have to spend so much overhead to get there. Uh, 18 wheelers going 
in the next five to 10 years, that is, that is where things are going. It's not enough property to be able to service 18 wheelers in a lot. We are realistic about that. However, being able to at least have one or two that can come through a day, uh, that's plenty of business for us. But the big deal for us, ah, uh, let me get back to this. And the other reason, the other thing about Union Springs, and I'll circle back to the bus uh, topic, is that the Koneku River, the tributary starts, the main tributary starts on our property. One more thing for a destination, one more thing that Friends of the River and Little and 4-H clubs can get attached to. And yes, we do have a beaver dam. <laughs> so how are we going to make use of that? Yes, there will be cameras in the beaver dam. <laughs> Why not? You know, although at first we have to move them because they are in a really good place right now. So we, and, but even that, how do you move beavers? And not, it, you know, dislocate, not do it in a way that allows them to feel stressed, et cetera. Part of the experience of the campus, all of this, everything we're talking about, the whole campus becomes this circular microcosm of things to where everything we do has a cause and effect. And we have another cause because of that effect. But it's, but all of it leads back into a, into it all being done. And that's what's, that's what's I so like about this being a campus is having that flexibility. Okay, and then that's just more of that. And this is the business part of the charging station. Right now at this point, Schools are, there is very big incentives for schools, for school buses to go electric. There is crazy economic incentives for this. And we are leading a charge on converting Little USA into being uh, uh, A, because it's a charging station, but B, being a proponent of having as many of their buses as possible retrofitted for being electric. Uh, and we're doing this in concert with NUVI, uh, Alliance for Electric School Buses, and Jobs to Move America. Jobs to Move America is what they have done with Hector Huezo uh, is, to, is the first multi-state community benefit agreements that's signed that benefits Alabama and California. What happened is that Bluebird, much like uh, Volkswagen, made a mistake. I don't know how much you know about the Volkswagen initiative. Uh, they lied about their emission standards. They were penalized for being bad. And they, what did they do? They turned lemons into lemonade. They created Electrify America, a for-profit business in which was funded completely by the, the penalties that they had to spend in order to create and be given the grant and the opportunity to be to put up electric EV charging stations on all major highways in the United States. <laughs> I give it to Volkswagen for being able to do that. I love it. It's great. I gotcha. Okay, really? so now. And, and yeah. amen, Herb. Our, our good friends, including Kathleen Kirkpatrick at Hometown Action, Hometown Organizing, have been part of the first community benefits uh, agreement, CBA, right here in Alabama. Um, based on with, from Jobs to Move America and, and, and this exactly what you're talking about. Amen. And I have and I have that video I think with her in it to where they made the announcement with the secretary, assistant secretary of labor, and the mayor of L.A. And the fact that it went and this was just serendipitous that I got introduced to Hector through Carolina of Alliance for Electric School Buses and Nuvi I met here in Las Vegas at a convention when they were pushing electric buses for Las Vegas. You know, so, and it felt, honestly, this is a little side thing, but it, it felt, you don't know how proud I was to know that I had a project that was good enough to talk to people of that level. It was, honestly, it, it, it was, it was, amazing for me to feel that good. So what we, just so the people that don't know what the community benefits agreement is, uh, let me just read from my notes. 
It's a commitment to develop a pre-hire training program that can grow into a bona fide apprenticeship, paid apprenticeship. The agreement formalizes the inclusion of the coalition partners in recruiting, training, hiring candidates from disadvantaged backgrounds and population historically underrepresented in manufacturing. And this is being focused towards buses. Uh, so what does Little USA get out of this besides being able to charge the school buses when they get this? A, training. How to put a maintenance on the buses? Where can that be done? You got it, because we're a training facility. So that is, so looking at us through the lens of Jobs to Move America, couldn't have asked for another alliance that's going to benefit everyone. And Nuvi is is ex the head. Tiffany is from Selma. <laughs> so she has got both feet on the ground as far as trying to make this happen because they do not have a presence in Alabama. So she wants to make this happen. Reasons why we want to get away from diesel, uh, emissions, the exhaust, uh, buses idle with the kids on them. There's absolutely no reason, you know, uh, uh, if you have the ability to upgrade, we can. And then when we look at this, there are 7,800 as of 21. Yeah, these are recent statistics. And look at the amount of children with asthma just in Alabama. Now, now we aren't saying it's caused by school buses. But what we are saying is that it contributes to that. And also you can look at the United States, the map on the left, and see the states that are committed to electric school buses and how, who has them. Reasons for it, prices, uh, uh, upkeep. Uh, and then finally, which is where a newbie comes into the scene, another pandemic lesson. Having the ability to have power access locally or close to you. So that when tornado, hurricane, et cetera, those kinds of natural disasters happen, that you aren't immediately taken off of the grid and that you enable, you're still able to be, uh, you're still able to, to survive and to be able to get power. The school buses, at night they aren't working. Plug in the bus, charge the battery, in an emergency, battery acts as a power source, we can push to the grid. That's the idea, that is it's called vehicle, vehicle to grid technology. The same thing that Tesla is pushing with their Teslas, is that you can put the Tesla in your house and power your house when you don't have electricity. This is just doing it on a bigger scale in a sense of being able to do it, pushing to the grid. Again, we're pretending that this is the at Alabama power, but this is a loophole which is why we're building the EV charging station. One loophole that they were not able to capitalize on is that an EV charging station, because you connect a, basically a wire, which has a plug on the end of it to your car, that is why we can do this because it's considered a plug because they can't regulate plugs. That means your toaster, <laughs> Every single thing that you plug into the wall, they can regulate. And the court, thank you, Amen. allowed us exactly to say, no, you can't regulate EV charging. Second thing, power that the batteries that we will have on site that we collect from the sun is ours. That power can be pushed to the grid in non-peak hours. That is another loophole. So the other thing about the vehicle to grid, it's another revenue stream for the, for the schools. They push their buses to this, we sell it out to the grid. Problem with uh, uh, Alabama Power, they charge 12, or should I say they pay 12 to 13 cents a kilowatt hour. They don't want to pay us four to five cents. Exactly. Four to five cents a kilowatt hour is what they want to pay us for being able to get power to them. 
Our goal at Little USA is to be 100% capitalized in the next three to five years. So legislation, people's attitudes, things are going to change, period, in a discussion. And when it does, we'll be 100% capitalized, 100% capitalized. So what does that look like to an investor? And that's what we're going for. And the fact that Union Springs is also in addition to being all of the food scarcity, et cetera, things, it is an opportunity zone. And currently, uh, Congress is repositioning or reevaluating the opportunity zone. And it, it seems as though the momentum is there to renew it and also to take away some of the things that were egregious about it that didn't make it really work. Uh, in a way that was fluid to people like yours, like us uh, uh, in trying to uh, make use of it. Um, now, the agrivotegs. This is where uh, I am actively looking in the next couple of months to build out my farming board. Uh, definitely need to have those type of experts uh, on board uh, because this technology is not new, or should I say this farming practice is not new. It's just new to the United States. Uh, and there's one other partner, Jack Solar Garden, who you're gonna see at the end of this presentation. They are the our uh, mentors in this, as, uh, in the United States. Byron uh, has done an amazing job and I will, uh, Kyle's going to have links to a lot of these things because I have taken these slides from many, many, many sources, uh, and I will provide links to Kyle so that he can present them to you all uh, uh, in a way that you can do more research on your own. Uh, so looking at that, this is what it is now with the earth. Notice how much goes to livestock, how much goes to crop. And that 77% of the 29% <laughs> of the land that's available for us to exist on. 23% of the land is used for agriculture. 23% of 29% of the world's land. Of oh, you got it. The chart's obvious. So the idea on, on Little USA, another reason for agrivotegs, is that it allows us to get more aggressive with being able to be a supplier to those who are doing plant-based meats. Uh, what's the advantage of it? Uh, what type of plants we grow? Right now, we still are at that point of where we are looking at uh, uh, mushrooms, uh, but you have to you have to grow what people eat, and that is the honestly the big thing is being able to what does the community want? Uh, that's obviously is realistic and can be produced underneath an agrivotag environment. And in looking at uh, this, this shows you that we are in the black belt. Uh, which in Union Springs, or should I say Bullock County, and you, what it roughly means is that it's 12 to 21 counties, central part of the state, uh, that, that uh, have extremely uh, rich soil. But it's beyond that, the Black Belt also was the hotbed of activity for civil rights in the South. Macon, County, Tuskegee Airmen trained at Tuskegee Airfield. Uh, Montgomery County witnessed the bus boycott from 1950 to 56. So it's not just the farming. It actually does also have a lot of ties culturally. Here we go with like, what else do you do with the farm? Well, we have all this produce. There's going to be waste from it. What can we do with it? Worm composter, yes, another business, yes, another need. Oh, the crops, they need to be pollinated. How are we gonna do that? Beehives, of course, pollinator project. Another thing, another source of learning, another source of revenue, because the hives can be rented out to other farmers. The wood, that's not any good for anything else. It depends on the wood, obviously. Wood pellets burn faster, 
cleaner. A uh, one ton of wood pellets equals 120 gallons of heating oil, 170 gallons of propane, 16,000 cubic feet of natural gas, or 4,775 kilowatt hours of electricity. <laughs> one ton. That's what that equals. And it allows you to have, uh, uh, what is it? A cleaner burning source. And we can produce that initially from the wood that we cut down from the trees. Okay, now we go to the agrivoltaic. And all of these slides came from the agrivoltaic conference, which honestly just finished you know, a few days ago. Uh, no, I did, wasn't able to go to Italy. You know, but I definitely know that that is, it will happen. But if you look at what they, they, they have more or less, they have identified four ways of uh, explaining agrivoltaics uses. Overhead for plants, overhead for animals. Overhead for animals, Texas, et cetera, they're shade, they aren't stressed as much. Obviously sheep, those kinds of things that are herd based that do that. And then we talk about how we do the agrivoltaics. And I have many examples that I will show you, but interspacing to where the space in between the panels is larger to A, allow for farm equipment, but also to allow for different crops that don't necessarily have to be as shade tolerant to be planted. And then the controlled environments to where you can have things like greenhouses that are covered by solar panels uh, to that are covered by solar panels. So this this just go through some of the so look at all the different spacing for agrivoltaic. And again, I'll send you the link to this conference catalog that has all these things in it. But depending on the crop determines the type of spacing. Because people say, but the money, the expense, that's the other reason for agrivoltaic. A, the money that you aren't making from the utility part is compensated for, or at least uh, enhanced because you also have produce. So you, you're, you're, you're making, one is making up for the other. You know, that is the, that is the goal, is that the crops offset the utility or the, and the utilities also help to offset what crops that you may grow. Because if you grow in something like those apples on the bottom left, I was listening to the discussion, those apples are extremely, they're expensive. And then there are some mushrooms that go for as much as $100 a pound. You know, so the idea of the crop, what you can do, obviously it's based upon where you are and what you're doing, et cetera. Got it, climate makes a difference. But that's the other reason for agrivoltaics is that it creates microclimates underneath the, the panels, which is the reason for the different spacing and also different heights. The higher it is, the more expensive it is. That's the other part of it. Uh, well, that's so exactly the, what I was about to say, is that the crops are going to need more shading in a warming world. Correct. And also, what does it do with more shading? It's less water. The first natural resource that's going to disappear on this planet is water. That's fresh water, as been as evident by this reading in the news about the countries in, in Africa that have two weeks left of water because of the extreme heat. That's happening today. So being able to be more efficient with our irrigation practices, even though we're going to have the Coquetru Koke River and we can tap into that river, how that river feeds the agrivoltaics and also how the panels then sweat and we collect that water and how the water doesn't evaporate as quickly and how because of the leaves becoming more aggressively looking for the sun for things like turnips and greens and things like that that actually want to create bigger. Again, that's why I need a farming board because the idea of trying to figure out the, the appropriate crops for these for, for to grow and also because we're a campus, we, are, we will have examples of a reasonable amount of these spacings throughout our solar field. That's what we want to be able to do. And yes, the organic panels on the left, which are made out of, they, they, they uh, allow 
for it to be almost like aluminum foil. And then you see the panels on the top, see how they mount it, but they're mounted east west. So it catch and they're and they are they catch the sun on both sides of those panels. They're bifacial panels, which means that they collect sun on both sides, which is also how the agrivoltaics are done. It's so that with the spacing, sun gets through the cracks, the sun bounces off the ground, then it's captured by the panels underneath. So it's not just the top of the panels that are capturing the sunlight. It's also underneath. Obviously not as much, but it doesn't matter how much. It's more, and that's the point. And so then having these panels face this way, they become fencing. Suppose you had herds or sheep. This allows you to use the panels as, as fencing. So it's doing a double duty. And then looking so that, and then we get to, this is Jack's solar farm. You know, so you see how he has, because he built this two years ago, he is using what was then the most common way of producing the panels. However, as you see, he has divided up his, acres to where he has many, many, many partners that are, that are using this in order to do research. University of Arizona, Cal State University. I mean, there's, there is those, each have their plot. Each one of those plots is a different research project. Meanwhile, he's growing. Meanwhile, he's producing energy. Okay, so we go all this land, all this resources, all this agrivoltaic. Well, this is what I want to do, <laughs> a vertical greenhouse, a 1300, this greenhouse by vertical harvest is a 13,000 square foot building. It has three microclimates and three greenhouse floors. It's a tenth of an acre. That one tenth of an acre of this building grows as much food as 40 acres traditionally. 40 acres of food in a tenth of an acre. So yes, I would like to meet someone from Vertical Harvest or, or, or other vertical farming businesses because there aren't any in Southern Alabama. There aren't any in Alabama that I know of. I've looked at a lot of them and they haven't built any yet. So yes, that is what we want. Because also another thing, which is why I like Vertical Harvest, is that they also employ uh, emotionally and physically developmentally challenged as 10 to 15% of their workforce. The workforce is not just able body. Little USA is not that way. We want to be able to serve the community and community isn't a segregated thing. We are extremely conscious of serving the 30% of the people that live at or near poverty. That is our target audience. That's who we want to serve first. But within that 30%, for all of the diversity of, of cultures and, and uh, physical challenges that are inherent to any society. So that is, a, that is one of our mantras is that we have to do that. And this is our a short list of uh, people that we are uh, uh, partnering with. Empowerment Works at the bottom right is our fiscal sponsor. We will be going after our 501c3 CDC designation uh, by the end of the year. And the CDC Community Development Corporation, what that will allow us to do is that instead of us asking for a $100,000 grant, knowing that we can get 10, as a CDC, we will be able to get the whole 100,000 and give you the 10. So we would be able to control the revenue so that we don't have to have some third party coming in, sapping up the money and then giving us a portion. No, not gonna happen. We want to be as much in control of our own destiny as we can be. Um, and that is the end of the talk. Thank you for your time. Wow, Herb. Um, <laughs> your, your, your talk makes me want to uh, uh, 
utter some expletives in a good way that we would just have to have to delete from the recording. So I'm just going to say again, wow. Um, I, I mean, you know, I, I'd heard some of this because, you know, we, we've had Rev and I've had the marvelous opportunity to, to, to visit you in, in Union Springs. And uh, I, I know we've spent some quality time on some Zooms related to, to, to grants and so forth. But, you know, I was still seeing through a mirror darkly as we, as we say, uh, Wow. I've learned a lot tonight. And uh, I know you're going to have a, a lot of follow up questions once we once we post this. Yes. Um, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is uh, I mean, this is where um, Rev and I are currently in, in, in Charlotte uh, with the U.S. Climate Action Network. And we've heard some inspirational things here this week. But this ranks right up there with some of the some of the most inspirational things we've heard. So. Well, wow. thank you for that. And and words of encouragement are it's what allows us to to move ahead. And I know that when one looks at this and sees all just some of the ideas, they go, that's a lot. You know, uh, the way our board and the way we're working is we we throw all ideas at the wall. What's the the Virgo in us does the ones that stick. The Aquarian, we never throw it away away the ones that don't. Because as you can tell from the way that I am talking, is that everything has to lead to something else. Uh, uh, so what if we provide good, clean energy to the citizens of Union Springs? So what if we bring the price of it down to, let's just do an analogy. You make $100 a week, your electric bills, $10, not a big deal. You make $20 a week, $10 is a lot. Okay, so now let's think about A, raising the income level to people so they can afford it. But B, what good does it do you to have a water heater on your back porch? In the summer, no big deal. In the winter, it's a problem. What about that water heater? How many, how can we now buy X amount of water heaters? I don't want to control that. Oh, local hardware store. You control the water heaters. We get them for you through grants so that they're cheaper to the, oh, wait a minute. We have to insulate the house so that it's insulated so that we can do it. Oh, okay. So that's what happens. Now we have all these solar panels on a field. One to three acres of the field is always going to be in flux. That's our goal. The other 18 to 20 acres of it will be, once we decide on the design, it'll be stuck. But one to three, what do we do if those one to three acres every X amount of weeks, years, however it works? The first time they get put onto the roofs of projects and library and government buildings in Union Springs. Oh, who does that? Ah. The students that just got trained at the NAPSAT? Oh, that's an idea, but wait a minute. Are we trying to, now they become what? Their own business to install these roofs, these things on their roof? That's even better idea. So not only are we going to train employees, our goal is to train employers. We, we don't, if you want to just be neck down, go for it. But there are definitely people who want to be neck up. There are definitely people who want to be in charge. The first two years of this project, the first initial year or two, we're going to be training the trainers. It is the most exciting time to be involved with this project. After the two years, you just don't get the benefit of having a great curriculum. But the first two years of students that come through this and we're cherry picking managers and we're growing businesses because we, this kit, the, the ghost kitchens, the food trucks, the agrivoteg, everything I've mentioned, all of those things are able to be grown off and spawned off into being businesses on their own. And yes, because we are a business, yes, we will get two to five percent of your profits. That's what we get for investing in you. Worth if it. You work around cooperative, that money stays right there in the community. That doesn't go to some CEO in another in another in another city. Uh, making 300 times the wage of the hourly wage of the of the workers. So there you wow. go. And you took the words out of my mouth, Kyle. There you go. 
owner cooperative exactly you got uh, it um, <laughs> you know the, the the bible tells us where there where there's no vision the people perish if you'll pardon the expression that's one hell of a vision so more power to you power to us <laughs> yes power to us all right well thank you thank you for giving me this chance and thank you for the opportunity and uh i'm going to continue to learn uh as i there's so much i know uh, but I have so much still yet to go through. And, and as I started a conversation off, you know, surrounding myself with, with uh, subject matter experts so that I can make qualified right decisions is, is the goal. So say we all. Amen.